Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today I am most happy to welcome you to a four-week series on the topic, The Computer Age and You. In order to accomplish our task of informing our viewers about this terribly important subject, we have broken the series into four different weeks. Today on our first program, our topic is going to be, What are Computers? And it's our task to try to define certain terms and explain things to you. In order to accomplish that, I'm very happy to welcome to the program, first of all, Mr. Gary Morgan, who is the executive Vice President of Data Line Systems Incorporated. Our second guest is Mr. Robert Newell, who is a teacher at the East Valley High School in Spokane. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to our program. We're looking forward to having you here today, and we're looking forward to this entire series and to aid in uh, learning more about uh, what computers are all about. Thanks, Tony. I'm welcoming to the panel also to uh, participate in questioning our guests. First of all, regular panelist uh, Mary Lou Reed, and our second. Uh, panel member is Mr. Kurt Nelson, who teaches computer science at North Idaho College. I would like to invite Lou Reed to commence the questioning. Well, gentlemen, the question today is, what are computers? And so let's start out by asking you, uh, what do computers do for us? What are the outstanding advantages that this new tool offers? Let's start with you, Gary. I think it's, it's easy to, to underestimate what can computers do for us? And basically, they can make our lives more efficient and more relaxing and, and uh, allow us to do things in less time than we have done before. And it may, easier, may be easier to say what can computers, what can't computers do than what can they do. They cannot think. They cannot be creative. Okay, uh, can you add to that, Bob? We're talking now basically time and efficiency. Are those the two, two key components? I think so. I was going to start out the other way and say that computers, we should not overestimate what they can do. I look at them sometimes as a machine that can do simple tasks very, very fast. And so we do go back to the programmer, the person who tells them what to do. And, of course, they do it extremely fast. And that's what we're trying to do today is simplify. And so it really helps to to simplify it down to say you really can do a task faster and you can do it with less waste more efficiently. Thank you. Kurt Nelson. The situation is you, you claim that computers can probably improve our lifestyle and probably make life easier for us, but there's many people in our audience that have a, a definite fear of computers mainly because they do not understand it at all. And probably the first question a person would say, uh, would be the leading one would say, uh, how does a computer work or what is really inside that box that really uh, uh, intrigues someone to delve into it as a career choice? What is really in there? How does that thing system work? You know, can you gentlemen explain and just, you know, I wouldn't say one sentence, what is a computer, but uh, if you had to explain to someone on the street to get over the fear of the computer technology, what would you recommend to this individual? I would say that it's a chip or a central processing unit which has various attachments to it. For example, there's memory capacity, a lar large amount of data can be stored and remembered. There's got to be some kind of an input device, and this turns out to be one of the slowing factors is getting the information into the computer. So be it keyboard or, or a computer card reader, what have you, you've got this slow input process. And then, of course, there's some way to get output from the computer, be it a TV screen or voice or, or what have you. You mentioned the word chip. Well, what does that mean to you, Gary? Just, if you had to tell someone what a, a chip, chip was. A chip is an acronym that's developed in the last five years or so to describe a, a piece of silicon that has many, many active transistor devices, and gates and transistors and diodes on it that performs an integrated function. And an illustration of a chip here. This is, this is a chip that is a complete microprocessor processing unit. It uh, happens to be an Intel 8085, which is an 8-bit chip. Uh, so today we have 
a whole computer in one chip. And that was not available 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, to have a whole computer required a rack full of printed circuit cards, like you might see here. Mm -hmm. A whole. So what you're saying is that recently, then probably something has happened in the computer electronics industry to really uh, flood the market and give everyone an opportunity to change their lifestyle because of that, and that's why we're seeing such a rapid change. Is that kind of what you're hinting at? That's the cost. Yeah. And as cost the cost factor. goes down and the size goes down, then the availability to the uh, wider and wider usage of them. Uh, going back for a minute to your question related to fear in what is a computer, I think it's important for us to relate, relate back to the people that were afraid of light bulbs and the people that were afraid of telephones. And I look at a computer as another tool, much like a skill saw or a drill. And and certainly it is more complex tool, but it's one that every day is being, is being presented to us in a simpler fashion, and we're making pro more and more progress in being able to tailor the computer to a specific application so that you can use it as a tool to do a specific function without being aware of the tremendous uh, complexity of the tool. In other words, I didn't have to know how to wind the armature of a motor in order to use a skill saw. Lou Reed. Let's explore a little bit more of the language, because I do think that that's important in crossing the fear barrier. Uh, you have mentioned input and output. Uh, perhaps I think that those are two examples of computer words that have become part of the English language. So I don't think they need as much explanation as uh, the words such as software. Bob, what is software? Okay, software is really a set of instructions for the computer that hopefully will do the job that you want to do. If you create it yourself, it's likely to. If you have to purchase it, you need something that's really tailored to your job. It's really, it's patterns of pluses and minuses or yeses and noes on a, a magnetic disk or something like this. I should have started with the question of hardware because hardware really is the basic. Gary, hardware and its relationship to software, please. Hardware is the stuff that I can touch and feel. It's, it's the stuff that is hard. And it, it's the, the mechanism by which the, less, the list of instructions, referred to as software, are executed. And a, a good analogy is figure out how to tell your three-year-old to run an errand for you. And you have to tell that, that hardware. The three-year-old is the hardware. The list of instructions in very excruciating detail is the software. And if you leave a step out of that, that three-year-old will get the wrong thing. Which is more important, software or hardware? You certainly need both. You've got to have the hardware before you can even attempt to, to do anything. I could clarify my answer to the software question. When a person buys software, often you pick something up. It's a disk or a diskette. But really, it's a little bit like saying you picked up Hamlet, you picked up a book that contains that work, but actually the thoughts and the words are abstract things. So, so the, software, the software is the brain? It's not the brain, but it's the data and the instructions upon which the brain works. <laughs> Thank you. The programmer How about that writes the software is the is brain. The, brain. This the is human is still the brain. The point you keep t trying to make, and, and I think that, that we should get really begin to understand that. Two more. Uh, words that I think need clarifying. Uh, storage and memory, are they the same thing? To me, they're a little bit different, and the storage is usually talked of as mass storage. It might be a disk drive or a, a hard disk unit where you're storing material that can be saved for three weeks, even after the computer's turned off, let's say. But uh, memory is an active sort of a thing which is being changed constantly as the computer moves numbers words and so forth from place to place within itself. And which of those two comes in K's? Either one. Either one. And uh, could you give some relative uh, sort of description to the, what a K means? A K is a thousand. In, 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 in accurate terms for a computer person, a K is 1,128. And one pieces of bites, information. Bits, pieces. Well, it can be a K byte or a K bit or 
a K nibble. And a large frame uh, has how many, approximately how many K would you say would be the difference between a, a micro and a large frame? You, you can no longer define a mainframe versus a mini computer versus a microcomputer in size of storage. You can no longer define the differences in physical size uh, alone, and you, you probably can only define those relative terms of what is a mainframe versus a microcomputer in terms of function and cost. And, and basically what people are now beginning to assume that a, a microcomputer is something that's under $10,000 and a mainframe would be something that is a million dollars or more. And the stuff that falls in between is some combination of micros and minis. Thank you. Kurt Nelson. You know, uh, microprocessors are being used in disguise. Uh, people are putting them in new appliances and in new cars, and the car tells you that the left front door is open. And People have an idea that computers are here and they're sneaking up on them, but I have found many people uh, that would two years ago would say, how come I have to learn programming? And now this year they would say, uh, I want to learn it. Uh, you don't have to convince them. So uh, what kind of programming languages would you recommend to a lay person out on the street or one that wants to further his own advances in business or whatever he has? What would you suggest for languages or what, are, what type of languages are available? I would recommend the basic language. The, the very word basic stands for beginners, all-purpose symbolic instructional code because it was developed so that people could get to the, the real ideas of programming quickly. It was developed at Dartmouth some years ago. Another good reason for BASIC is that there's so much software that's been written in it that it's a good language to know. There are certainly others that have features BASIC doesn't have, but BASIC's a good one to have. Mm -hmm. Mike, I, I would agree with Bob with the cautioning note that, that BASIC is very non-standard. And every, but it is available on almost every micro that you'd walk into a computer store today to buy, but it'll be a little bit different, just about enough different to uh, confuse you. So you need a book with each microcomputer you'd purchase. That's right. Uh, but the basic, the, the initial set of instructions oriented toward basic are fairly common. So it's a good learning, it's a good starting point. But it's also important to, that the person consider whether or not they really want to learn programming. Today, microprocessors are available and, and personal computers are available at the state where they, they can be very useful for a variety of home functions and small business functions and never have to learn programming. And so that's one of the reasons they're becoming more friendly and more acceptable as a tool. Something, Gary, you and I have talked about earlier when we were preparing for this program, and that was dealing with networking, uh, both information age oriented and the service age. Uh, we just have so much to get in this four weeks, we can't get it all in, but I think it's important uh, uh, from the questions the panel already asked that the viewers have some idea of the basic parts of computer. We'll, we'll get some more of that later on the program today, but uh, I think we're getting in with networking and talking about what it can do for people uh, in this country and in other countries. Would you give us a little bit of a a thumbnail sketch of what we're talking about in networking, both information and service-wise. Sure, Tony. I'll try. What led to that conversation, I believe, was that we were talking about, well, what kinds of things do you use computers for? And I, I made the statement that, that one of the things that is coming very rapidly is that computer is a tool for communications. And that what we look at in the, in the 80s and 90s is that we are we are probably leaving what we, we have come to call the industrial age and, and we are coming into what we would call the information age. And I, I found it interesting, last night I was reading the latest issue of this, this journal and the whole issue is dedicated to the subject that they call information utilities. And uh, meaning that just like Washington Water Power services gas and electricity, there are many, many companies springing up that's, that furnish information on a service basis. And they may do law searches, they may do searches for, for schools, but they will, you will see a great transition from the traditional library to uh, a computer-oriented information service. 
And this can happen in other areas like uh, politics, voting analysis, All of just any field. Any field, because it, it, what we're experiencing is an information explosion. And the only way we can handle the volumes and volumes of information and organize it to get it to the proper place at the proper time is by the use of the computer tool for organizing and storing and fetching and retrieving that. Lou Reed. Well, what communications technology do you believe that the computer uh, is going to replace? Does this mean that we are really going to do away with magazines and newspapers and, and books? Um, do you have any, asp any f typewriters? Do you think the typewriter is going to become less and less used? Yes. What do you think, Bob? Possibly so. If you can store a document easily in computer memory and, and print it out at any time you want, I think that would prevent you from having a standalone typewriter and a big filing cabinet with it. Could, could you expand on this in relationship to, to other kinds of paper? I mentioned newspapers, magazines. I th it'll be a long, long time before we see the the newspapers, the magazines, and the, and the books that we're so familiar with being replaced. But, but we are already beginning to see some of the, the rapid movement type of communications, like the Wall Street Journal is presently on uh, uh, two or three different information utilities. And, and the Library of Congress supposedly is going to The go Patent online. Office, uh, Congress passed an act this year to put patents on computers. Patent searches will now be computerized. And are there, are there not some limits or some cautions involved in this, such as cost and uh, right now nostalgia? I hate to give up my daily newspaper. Well, certainly there's a limit to how much information you can save on disks or wherever it's being saved. And so the question is, which of this information is valuable to the most people? I certainly keep old magazines, too. Kurt Nelson. Seems to me that if, if you try to keep things, a lot of things have been kept already in history, and you can probably re-enter that information on computers. But you said the word information revolution. Now, what does that mean to the person who's thinking of uh, pursuing a career or a job about five years down the road or two years or maybe next year? Uh, President Reagan said a high-tech society, and you hear words about uh, we have to know computers to get a job and information. What would you recommend to any person at all that wants to retrain himself? What would you say the minimum requirement to learn to use a computer system would be? Minimum requirement to retrain for a new job. I think the person ought to have a computer literacy class of some kind to know a little bit of the history, where they fit into our society now and where they're going to fit in. The person ought to be able to type. I think that's going to be much more important as time goes by. It's, we talk about an information age that we're moving into in the computer. I would be simplifying too much to call it just a page turner instrument that finds a piece of data for us. But we do still have to be able to reasonably use that data. We still have to study logic. We still have to know what, how to process data ourselves. I would also uh, wonder about uh, the question of um, the use of computers. If it's been such a revolution so quickly that, say, 10 years from now, 15, uh, well, you need to know as much as you do now to use a computer. I mean, I'm wondering some of these languages aren't going to come obsolete rather quickly. Uh, what's your opinion on that, Gary? Languages are like golfers. Uh, you know, they, they won't go away. They'll, they'll become less used. Um, there will be new languages that will become more and more popular. And more simple. And s easier to use. Yes. Um, and we're going to begin using tools like what people are now familiar, a lot of people are familiar with a tool called VisiCalc, electronic spreadsheets that are available on all the home computers. And you don't have to have programming to use that. You, you use it like an accountant or any, any, any manager uses a spreadsheet. You know, it's just a, it's an electronic spreadsheet. We're going to have to move into the next part of our program, and I appreciate uh, both of you for being here on this part. Mr. Robert Newell has brought with him uh, some of his students. In fact, I think he has about 10 here from the East Valley High School. And Mr. Newell, I've heard some really positive comments about the use of, uh, uh, I guess, simulation games or, or role playing in relation to computer. And, and you have selected 10 <coughs> students. I know you have about 40 that you do um, these games with. And uh, I think our viewers might benefit from uh, what your students have done. Uh, I understand your students learn a lot by this role playing, but secondly, that in showing it to other people, it teaches other people about what a computer is. And I wish you would introduce your 
uh, fine students you have here and tell us before they do the role playing uh, how you conduct this simulation. Okay, this simulation is based on an idea by Alan Dunn of the Onalaska School District. And in this one, each student plays one of the parts of computer input, output, and so forth, and been mentioned. One person is really a person, they're the operator. Everyone else that we see is going to represent some part of the computer system. Um, what they will do is run through a brief program, program that averages some numbers, and show just how that data is manipulated through the computer, how it goes from, from raw input to the correct answer, we hope. Fine. We will invite the students to come in. I'm the input, and I would be the keyboard. I'm the control. I get my information from the input and uh, feed it onto the rest of the computer. I'm the arithmetic unit, and I receive and give information from the control. I'm the output unit. I only take information from the control unit. My job is to give information to the operator. I'm the storage unit. I take information from the control unit and stick it in different memory areas. I have a program here on these cards, and I'm going to mix them up and input them into the computer. I'm going to take the program and put it in an order and then pass it on to the rest of the computer to run the program. Now I'm going to tell the computer to run the program. Run. This is a program to average two numbers. Give me two numbers. But wait for the operator to input two numbers. I'm putting two numbers in the computer now. Make a copy of this number and put it in storage A. Okay, 11 goes in storage A. Make a copy of this number and put it in storage B. Okay, number 3 goes in storage B. Okay. Adds storage A and B and divide the result by 2 and return the answer. 7. The average of 11 and 3 is 7. That's the end of the program. They're going to now do a second program. Uh, they're switching positions and indicate that a computer does a lot of different kinds of uh, work and a lot of, lots of kinds of programming. Is that right, Mr. Newell? That's right. This program will find the tallest, medium, and shortest person out of a group of three. I am the operator. I'm the only human that can talk to the input. Output. This program will tell who is tallest, next tallest, and shortest. To output. Give me three people. Input, wait for the operator, wait for the names of the three people they fetch, those people, and give to control. Run. Storage, put the first person in seat A, the second person in seat B, and the third person in seat C. Not in order. Take them out of order. A 
arithmetic unit. Um, compare the heights of, of the data in seats A and B and return answers of who is the tallest to, of the two. B is taller. Storage, put the answer from arithmetic unit in seat A and the other in seat B. Put tallest in seat A and shortest in seat B. Arithmetic unit, compare the height of the data in storage seats B and C and return the answer of who is tallest of the two. C is tall. Storage, put them in order. Arithmetic unit, compare the heights of the data in seats A and B and return answer of who is tallest of the two. B is tall. Storage, put the answer from the arithmetic unit in seat A and the other person in seat B. Output. Person A, Kevin, is tallest. Person B, Brad, is next tallest. And person C, Heather, is the shortest. End program. Now, Mr. Newell, uh, in relation to what they have been doing, we're just about out of time. Uh, this is an indication that uh, the programmer has given orders through the input, and uh, they've been doing different combinations in the computer based on the instructions they've been getting. Is that correct? Right. Yep. The person who acted the part of the operator could be considered to be the programmer, too. And so it's in the all in the cards, really, that this worked. It didn't depend on what order the three people were in to begin with. And you can get any order or combination. But as, as indicated by one of the students in the role playing, uh, the answer you get is instantly. When, uh, in the program prior to this one, when they asked the number, we got seven immediately. So uh, human beings can do this too, but computers can just do it so much quicker and can use such much uh, large amount of data uh, very quickly. Right. I understand too that uh, the whole process is just on and off. Uh, you're turning on and off as far as the information you're getting, closing it or opening it and getting the data. That's right, ones and zeros. Well, I want to express on behalf of our staff, uh, thank you. Uh, to all your students and yourself and to Gary Morgan of Data Line Systems for our opening uh, program of our four weeks on what are computers and I think that our viewers will find this informative and I hope you'll be with us again next week and we'll talk about the role of education in the computer revolution, primary, secondary, and higher education and following that program the next week we'll deal with personal small business computer service for the home and for small businesses and our last week will be computers and what it's doing for the economy in the Inland Empire. I hope all of you have a very good week and please be with us for the next three shows that we'll be bringing on your computers. Have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today I welcome you to program number two in a four-week series on the subject, The Computer Age and You. Our program today is going to emphasize the role of education in the computer revolution. In order to accomplish our goal of discussing that very important topic, I'm happy to welcome to our program, first of all, Dr. Howard Gage, who is with Wh Whitworth College, and second is Dr. Joe Thomas, who is an employee of Keytronics Corporation, and our third guest is Gary Morgan, who is the Executive Vice President of Dataline Systems. 
Gentlemen, I want to express my appreciation for your taking time from busy schedule to discuss this topic with us. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to welcome to the panel, first of all, Mary Lou Reed, who is a regular panelist of this program. Uh, second is Dr. Owen Cargill, who is Director of Planning at North Idaho College, and Mr. Kurt Nelson, who's an instructor of computer science at our Pleasure. institution. I will invite Lou Reed to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony. I'd like to address my first question to Dr. Gage, if I may. Dr. Gage, uh, what role do you think uh, the computer is playing in changing the way we educate our children? What difference does it make having uh, terminals in a first, cla cl first grade classroom? Well, I think, that first of all, uh, the teacher shouldn't be worried about the fact that computers are going to replace the teachers. I don't think there's any danger of that. But is it I think a different experience for the it child? It is going to be a different experience. I think that we're going to make it possible for the children to have a chance to play with technology, grow up with the technology, so that they're comfortable with it in a way that adults are finding it difficult. So I see that as one of the positive things. I think record keeping for teachers, uh, Opportunities to do drill work for teachers and so for, for the students as well will be a good experience for them. Do teachers worry about the fact that they may be uh, replaced? Are they uncomfortable with this? I think the, the teachers are probably more uncomfortable with the computer than the students are. The students find it very easy and are very comfortable with it. There's a certain nervousness on the part of the teachers to become comfortable with the computer as it's brought into the classroom. Which is true of all adults right, right. now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cargill. Thank you, Dr. Gage. If we could follow up on that for just a moment. Could you identify for us uh, how the computer education in elementary and secondary school will impact other aspects of the curriculum? Well, I think one of the things that we'll see is that the uh, computer will be used in more than just the scientific areas which we've thought of it as in the past. Uh, for example, in the elementary school, the level of sophistication for the children is somewhat l limited in, in mathematical skills, but there are opportunities to provide uh, experience for them using the computer in, in geography and history and, and, and some of the other areas that most people don't think of. And so we have a chance to get them exposed in ways that are, I think are important. And then later when they move into junior high and high school and develop their mathematical skills, we'll see them using computers in the way we normally think of them doing. Kurt Nelson. Yeah, I'd like to direct the question Dr. Uh, Thomas. Uh, right now, uh, institutions of higher learning and colleges, vocational schools, et cetera, are really training uh, students in computers. They're trying their best. We have a, an awful influx of students taking programs, and some students say, I wonder if there'll be any jobs. They think it'll saturate. What's the employment outlook in the future for computer science, engineering, technical type people? What, what does the outlook look like down the road? It, uh, it looks very good, I think, for all different levels of training in computer science. I think uh, if you look, you know, look where the demand is, you'll find, uh, with the uh, exception possibly of the, maybe this particular region, uh, most of the jobs are in the data processing uh, area. In this particular geographical area, in the North Idaho and Eastern Washington area, we have a, a high influx of jobs that are probably more scientifically oriented in terms of design of computer or peripheral type systems. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the job outlook is going to remain high and uh, if you look at the national studies that are coming out of the different professional organizations and out of the federal government, I think you'll find probably a ratio of somewhere between three to five in terms of uh, difference between supply and demand of people that are trained in you know, college level training either in two or four year programs in computer. Any, anything related to computers, whether it's uh, uh, engineering, uh, computer aspects of engineering or in computer sciences itself. Well, let's address a question to Gary Morgan. Um, Gary, the uh, computer is also an educational toy. And would you like to talk a little bit about the value and the, of the use of games in education? Is this a good way to teach? Well, I think, as Howard indicated, that one of the items that you have to address is familiarity with a new media or a new uh, device and certainly the area of game playing more for more for adults even than children again is is a good way to to uh, forget that the machine is there and forget forget about that it's a computer and a foreign device and get involved in in what's happening then it really is a bridge really to, That's to right. draw people in That's how right. young can can you start uh, with games uh, on a computer? Two, probably, three years old. Are there very, very early. Are there, are there some problems of coordination? Are there, what, are the, what, what do you have to wait for until they can talk? 
No, uh, because uh, many, many game, game computer-related games now are strictly uh, uh, movement-oriented and, and pointing and uh, graphic recognition and uh, with and voice, Vo both voice input and voice uh, synthesis. And most of us are familiar with uh, the Speak and Spell that you can buy for, what, 30 to 40 to 50 dollars now. It's a very educational, that's a computer game. I think it's interesting that you're saying it's more valuable uh, with adults. Are most of the computer training uh, programs for adults start geared to start with games? I don't know. I think they're, what I've seen in terms of computer training for adults or retraining of people at the adult level is very poor. That's probably one of the biggest areas of, that we need to work on is, is trying to get uh, retraining programs going that are uh, acceptable to adults coming out of the, uh, the other industries and the other places. But I, my own experience has been that the easiest, one of the best ways to get adults feeling at ease with a computer is to let them play games on it. I believe Dr. Gage would like to address the, the point about that uh, in the Well, I guess two things. One of the things, the most beneficial thing about games is the people who gain the experience writing them. And it turns out that junior high and high school kids have proven to be fairly successful in writing some of the more sophisticated games that are on the market today. Mm -hmm. And so the actual challenge of writing them can turn out to be as valuable as, as uh, the fact that kids play them afterwards. Well, it's so very it important to note that, that writing a, a game program is not simple, right. is not trivial. And it's creative, and I think this is important to bring out that there is a creative side of the computer world. Right. Gary, the other thing that you had mentioned too was the training of adults, and we think so often when we talk about training of adults that we're going to teach them how to program. And I think we have to refocus on the fact that there are a lot of uh, exciting uh, software packages that are already available, such as VisiCalc for these electronic worksheets that allow you to do uh, schedule planning and so forth, word processors, and et cetera, that to me also gives them a chance to get exposed to the computer and to bring it into their everyday uh, working well, life. Very important, Howard. I, I think t we have taught people incorrectly that they have to be programmers in order to use a computer tool, and that, that is more so today and it's going in the in the ongoing years, that's exactly what we're going to accomplish in the, in the computer profession is making that tool be available to the lay person without having to understand the tool. Dr. Cargill. Thank you. For individuals who may wish or, or need to make a mid-career change, either because uh, an individual might be interested in, in changing fields or because the field that they're currently working in has become obsolete, what kind of, of training, I, I would like each of you to answer this, what kind of training do you feel is, is important for someone who feels that, that he or she may now wish to get in the computer field? Maybe we should start with Dr. Thomas. Uh, I, th I think, you know, you have to identify what their objectives are and in, in their future goals and things. Uh, we've uh, had a graduate program at the University of Idaho sometime, basically, that took uh, people from other disciplines, non-CS non or non-scientific disciplines, biology, forestry, agriculture, something like that, put them through. And the question is, you know, do they want to use that computer training as a, as a field in itself, or do they want to use it to supplement what areas that they're, you know, their past, past training? It, th those are two different career choices and two different directions to go in. Uh, it, as it turns out, there, there are a lot of programs, and you can successfully orient a, a, a graduate-type program in computer science you know, to satisfy the needs of the forestry major, the agriculture major, something like this, to get it to the point where they can use that type of training in, in the field that they were originally trained in. Now, if, if they want to, say, use, you know, computer training as a field in itself where they would go in as computer professionals, then their, the training they got to go through is quite a bit more extensive. Uh, if you get a, a graduate degree, say, in computer science and are expected to work in that area, then the, your, the expectations in terms of your employer are different than if you are going to combine, say, computers and forestry. But I think it's also interesting to note, though, Joe, that it's been my experience that some of the best computer people in, in professions over the years that I've worked have come from non-computer science curriculums and from, from all sorts of, of uh, backgrounds 
computers are unique in, th in themselves, as you well know, and, they, and you either excel in them and, and it kind of grabs you or not. And it uh, depends on the personality of the person mm -hmm. more than the than educational background, I think. Uh, and we, we are at the point now, you know, uh, I think computer science is just now starting to evolve into a field in itself. In the past, it's really been hard to identify what, what was in computer science. And consequently, a lot of the people came in from other disciplines, like you, like you pointed out there, and are, you know, have been very productive in that. I, I think now that computer science, that area is changing indeed into a profession and into a science. And there's starting to be you know, discipline associated with, with the computers. And uh, uh, an important point here, I think, is though that uh, computer science is something that does take a, a, a lot of ability, you know, natural ability and things, and people can evolve in, like Gary pointed out, from other uh, other areas. There's a lot of ingenuity involved. In a lot of engineering uh, ingenuity involved, and it's not it's not something that people should should think is not possible. Uh, maybe the retraining program is self-training. Uh, with the price of com microprocessors and per personal computers coming down the way the way it is, a good example is one of the one of the best programmers on our staff today uh, does not have a college degree and uh, trained himself while he worked at a lumber yard. And uh, he's a, he's a, a beautiful programmer. Dr. Gay. I really like currently to think of computer science for most people will be in the interdisciplinary nature so that two natural breakdowns would be those with sort of a business flavor and those with a scientific flavor. And so someone with a good accounting background, someone ha who has some management skills, someone who ha has an understanding of how the corporate structure works can take advantage of that and tie in and, and broaden their opportunities by adding the computer skills as well. Or a scientist or a mathematician finds it very easy to do problem solving and use the computer as a tool. And I see that if a person does master some of these other areas, their, their opportunities for employment and their chances for growth uh, are really enhanced. A large area of, of use of the computer as, as a tool is in the administrative areas, the clerical and administrative areas. Uh, all secretaries should know how to use a word processing machine or a, or a personal computer today. For any viewer who has joined our program in progress, our topic today is the role of education in the computer revolution. It's the second in a four-week series on the topic of the computer age and you. Our guests today are Dr. Howard Gage from Whitworth College, Dr. Joe Thomas, formerly with the University of Idaho and now with Keytronics, and Gary Morgan, the Executive Vice President of Data Line Systems. We shall continue the questioning with panelist Kurt Nelson. I'd like to open up the question to all three panel members, like we did on the last one. Uh, there, we have many people in our community and, and even the whole United States that are jobless and they're thinking of retraining but uh, they're probably scared to delve into something with computer science. The math background is weak. And so what kind of a social uh, change uh, or social consequence do you think? Do you think those people will be permanently unemployed or is it possible to train them with minimal skills? What would you envision for those type people that do not want to go back and take one or two years of college or three or four classes, what is the minimum skill requirement that you might see for these people? Gary? It, that's a really broad question, as you might. Yeah, high tech society, minimum skills. What do you consider that as, as being? It, I think Joe addressed that correctly um, a minute ago in that the first thing that that person has to decide is, is what their goals are. It, you know, do they want to tr attempt to use the computer as a tool in their present job skill area or knowledge that they presently have? Is that possible even? Or are they interested in actually going into a, a new field that is in the, in the involved in computers and the information age? And, and if, if they are, what's available in their, within their, their geographical range in terms of, of target job opportunities? And so having looked at those alternatives and set some own their own goals, then they've got to select a way for them to get some training toward those goals. And the best way is the junior colleges. And maybe the second best way is to select some, some private colleges that offer that specific training. Uh, and certainly they should not ignore the, uh, the possibility of purchasing uh, a kit 
train from Radio Shack or Heathkit or uh, or one of the other many personal computer stores around and, and getting hands on. The one nice thing about computers, remember we were talking about using computers in the classroom to train kids. And uh, the computer is a very, it has infinite patience. So, so there's no replacement for spending hours and hours on the computer yourself. Dr. Thomas? Yeah, I think uh, there are, uh, we, the, the people in education have a long ways to go yet in terms of learning how to, how to, uh, you know, upgrade people, say, that, that do want a, a change in career. Uh, we've, uh, I've seen several unsuccessful experiments tried in the last few years, basically, where you would take off and, uh, through a videotape or various other means, try to teach people, say, a programming skill or something like that. I don't think that's necessarily the answer. I think there are a lot of things we could be doing in terms of training people uh, how to use computers and uh, I think the most effective way is just to make a computer available maybe for people you know to sit down and, and get get acquainted with and get remove the fear of actually using the thing if libraries would go in schools uh, colleges such as this would go in set up labs for people to use I think that once they could sit down and uh, work with a computer and learn it probably we can be fairly successful in training people uh, to try to teach a person how to do assembly language programming without a computer there to work on, I think we're almost destined for failure, you know, with that type of thing. They need hands-on experience. Given, given the capability of, you know, getting hands-on experience, I think that uh, most people can be retrained and probably, you know, to a fair level in terms of how to use a computer. Dr. Gage. Well, most of the area schools are quite involved in continuing studies. As you mentioned, we have a long ways to go in terms of this area as well as other areas of working with adults rather than the typical 18 to 22 year old and recognizing the time frame of which adults are working on where they're often holding down a job, raising a family and trying to go to school. Many of us have experienced that. But it, I think it depends on the level at which uh, Kurt, that they're thinking about entering. Very short periods of time could uh, make it possible for people to learn how to use a word processor or electronic worksheets or some of the uh, software that is already available to people. If you want to get into sophisticated computer science work where a person is becoming a, a programmer, a systems analyst, etc., I think it's a long process to become good at that. There, there isn't a shortcut. You must develop your problem-solving skills through taking mathematics courses, uh, business courses, and other types of courses that help you to uh, do some logical thinking. You know, not too long ago, libraries used to have uh, typewriters. You could go in and use a typewriter, and, or you could put a nickel in a slot and use a typewriter for an hour. Uh, it may not be such a bad idea to have computers available for public, uh, maybe a computer laundromat, so to speak, uh, where they could go in and use computers uh, at will at any time they wish. I think, Kurt, in the future, we're going to find out a, a much bigger improvement, not through necessarily any, any innovations in terms of education, but as computers get easier to use, uh, more and more people are going to be able to sit down and start using them. And I guess the, the, where we would like to end up is for a person to sit down and use the computer to where the computer actually would be transparent to him. He would, the, the user would interact you know, in terms of data input and a, a display, a, an output of some kind. But really what goes on and how the computer works internally uh, isn't, isn't obvious to him. I think really to get computers into broad scale use in our general population we have to get to that point. The, the operation of the computer has to be transparent to the user. So what you see then is kind of a master keyboard that you'll train a person to use and then the machine will follow the instructions such as like in sawmills where you have cutoff saws, etc. So you would yeah. train these people if they have the keyboard experience. Yeah, if, yeah. They, if they can enter the data, the, the software internal to the, to the computer basically will take care of the application. And it's and not that far off. An another area we want to get into, uh, time is rushing by. Dr. Gage, my question is addressed to you, and that deals with the viewers that are watching that are maybe in high school and are seniors and they're going to college, and they have uh, decided that they will receive a baccalaureate, hopefully, and maybe even a master's in the field of computer science. And if I am correct as a lay person who's very ignorant in this field, there are two major areas at least that one could pursue for the baccalaureate and master's. I'm trying to separate the student who majors in uh, what we call, might call the computer technician or programming area versus the students that would go into, uh, I believe at some schools they call it computer information systems or services. Could you tell us the difference between those two curriculums and which curriculum should you choose depending on what you want to do? In other words, what I'm asking, 
if you get a degree in programming, what could you do uh, in an occupation versus if you get it in the information systems? Okay, well actually uh, many of the community colleges run these technical uh, programs for training electronics techs which could do some uh, repair of equipment, possibly do some uh, diagnostic programming to check out equipment and so forth. So this would be one of the areas, and Spokane is blessed with some good schools in the area. SCC in Spokane does a good job of this. The uh, industry has been pleased with the kind of work they're doing. Uh, Spokane Falls is looking at possibly doing a similar thing with a little more of a software bend to it so that people get some exposure uh, to programming and working with, uh, with technicians in that area. So there is that uh, opportunity for students there. At the four-year college level, I would see possibly two kinds of curric curricular opportunities. We, we at Whitworth have developed two majors uh, in computer science, one with a business option and one a scientific option. And when I was uh, waiting for this program to start, I noticed uh, a bulletin pinned up on Curtis's uh, door indicating much of the same kind of thing that I'll say here. And that is that the business option, we have students who will complete background in computer science and in business and in fact will be approximately three courses short of a traditional business major. But they will understand how to program, they'll have done work in systems analysis. Hopefully we can provide opportunities for them to have internships in industry so they have some kind of an idea of uh, what they'll be getting into and whether they really want to do it. But for example, if they went with let's say a large corporation, they might do a lot of, of program writing uh, to help that organization set up a business system in a certain way. One of the nice things about having some computer skills is it gives you what I would refer to as entry-level skills into the job market. Even if a person long range becomes president of, the, of a company because of their administrative skills, rarely will they be turned, the company be turned over to them when they graduate from college. But how about the person who's going to pursue maybe all the way through the master's the computer information services? They're not involved. They might have had some course, but they're not involved in the programming aspect. They, their main duties uh, will be in other areas, will it not be in their, in their occupation or career? Right. They're, well, they have an opportunity. You really open the opportunities in many directions. Uh, just like when you finish a major in, in, in business or other things, you may or may not go into management, but it gives you some skills to uh, do v a variety of, of things. I, I just want to pursue this one step further. I'm a little bit confused yet. If you were majoring in the computer information systems, would you not also understand about basic computers and what their capacity are and what, how that would fit different institutions and what they would need? Sure. You would have the ability to... Uh, to apply your background in, in business and in computing to develop uh, systems that would be used by various companies. You could be in a consulting capacity. Right. Thank you. Lou Reed. Gentlemen, we haven't discussed the issue of costs to educational systems of the computers. And I would assume that this would be a problem, especially uh, on, in school districts where you're talking about uh, inequities between have, have not school districts and have school districts. Would you expand on that a little bit? Could we start with you, Dr. Bates? Every school is trying to uh, get facilities in, into the schools from gra uh, grade 1 through 12 and then also the college level. And it's not unique to the uh, K through 12. It w also, uh, colleges are having difficulty. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education indicated that a typical university or college has about one-third of the computer facilities that they need and the backlog of people trying to get on the equipment and to provide the kinds of coursework, getting the instructors with a background is really a critical problem. One of the things that the K through 12 uh, situation that we must deal with, in addition to equipment, is being careful about uh, providing valuable training for the teachers so that uh, when the equipment comes, they're able to intelligently use it. And I would see that also as important as getting the equipment. Dr. I think there's a substantial cost, in, independent of where you start going and start putting in computers, uh, in terms of training, internally training people and getting the equipment. And, uh, Different different educational levels, I think, have to look for, you know, ways to get that get the money one way or the other. The, uh, in the K through 12, obviously, it has to come out of tax, probably of some kind. Although there is a bill before Congress now, uh, I don't know what the name of it is. It's called the Apple Bill, because that's who was pushing it was Apple Computer, where they basically could take a, a tax write-off and put one one Apple in every school in the U.S. Uh, companies could. Uh, I think, you know, the, the K through 12 is going to have to look for, for that mechanism. Well, is, is the student who comes from a school district where they have not been able to afford it going to be seriously disadvantaged if, when he or she reaches college? I, I think so. We're, uh, particularly, you know, it, depending on what they major in, but in particularly if they go into uh, a, a discipline where 
uh, you expect uh, expect them to have some some knowledge of computers, and that that's going to be more and more common anymore. You know, it, uh, as you come into some curricula, you're going to be expected to have a certain background in computers, just like you're expected to have a certain background in math and science and and this. So, it, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna hurt. Uh, so three students. R's plus C. Pardon me. Three R's plus C. Right. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to have to interrupt. Uh, the time flies when you're dealing with an interesting subject. We're out of time. I want to thank all three of you gentlemen and the panel uh, for participating in this very informative program. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been discussing the role of education in the computer revolution, and our guests have been Dr. Howard Gage of Whitworth College, Dr. Joe Thomas, formerly of the University of Idaho and now with Keytronics, and Gary Morgan, the Executive Vice President of Dataline Systems. I would like to take this opportunity to inform you, as I indicated at the beginning of the program, that we have two more in this series on uh, the computer age and you. Next week we'll talk about personal and small business computer services and what's good for the consumer in both the home and uh, in small businesses. Following that program, our fourth and final in our series will be entitled Computers and the Inland Empire Economy. And some representatives from some of the corporations in the Spokane area will discuss with you what is happening in those industries and employment and payroll and how they're servicing uh, various institutions and organizations within not only the Inland Empire but throughout the United States and even other countries in the world. We are bringing you this four-week series because we believe that it is very vital uh, to your future and what may be happening. I hope you're enjoying the series and will be with us again next week. Please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. I wish to welcome you to the third week in a four-week series on the topic, The Computer Age and You. On this third program, we're going to discuss the subtopic, personal or small business computer services. In order to deal with that very important topic, I'm happy to welcome to our program Dr. George W. Trusty, Jr., who is the president of Articulate Systems Incorporated. Uh, Dr. Trusty will discuss with us uh, the type of computers that are available for your use in your home or for small businesses. Dr. Trusty, as uh, always, it's a pleasure to talk with you about this important subject, and I thank you for all the work that you've done in this uh, four-week series that we're doing. I also want to welcome to the panel to assist in the questioning of our guests on this important subject. First of all, Mary Lou Reed, a permanent member of the panel, uh, Dr. Owen Cargill, who is Director of Planning and Associate Dean of Instruction at North Idaho College, and Ray Myers, who heads the Computer uh, Program Services at North Idaho College. And I would invite Lou Reed to commence the questioning. Dr. Trusty, would you describe the vast array of small computers that are now on the market for uh, home and small business uh, people to buy? What do you see when you go into a computer store? <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's try to categorize it in terms of size first. Uh, physical size can be as small as, uh, say, four inches high, uh, six inches long, and an inch and a half deep. Uh, up to uh, uh, a component system which uh, can be quite large, uh, as large as uh, a television set requiring a special station uh, for both the uh, central processing unit, uh, a monitor station, a printer station, a keyboard station, um, and uh, on up to a multi-user multi system which might require a repetitive unit similar to that. So we have a, pull, uh, a pretty large range of 
available computers uh, that fall into the range of home and small business. What is the significance then of size? Size basically uh, is only significant uh, as it relates to the end use of the computer itself. Uh, for example, a very small portable system might well be used by an executive in his lap while uh, commuting from one uh, business destination to another, as opposed to uh, an in-house system where several departments are communicating with a uh, central uh, system, a large database central in form and possibly a large program based central in form. And obviously price is going to be involved in this. Pretty linear, yes. Okay. However, we have some very small things that cost a good deal. Dr. Cargo. Dr. Trotsky, what can the home computer do for the average person and, and is the personal computer for everyone? I'm not sure that the personal computer in its current state is for everyone based on their anticipated results of what a computer is supposed to do for you. Uh, I think probably one of the most significant problems we incur daily is the notion that when a person perceives the use of a computer, they generally perceive it as they've seen it on a media source somewhere, i.e. Uh, push a button and a tremendous amount of activity will occur basically with a single keystroke. Uh, the current state of the art is such that it does require a little um, effort, a little instruction, and uh, some diligence on the uh, part of the users. So uh, basically, um, the technology that's available today is uh, very helpful to and can be uh, to the average person if they bear in mind that there are some restrictions still. Uh, common uses are um, word processing, data management, and uh, electronic spreadsheets, and they would apply uh, both to the small businessman and the home user. Ray Myers. And Dr. Trusty, I have a question. <coughs> I refer to it as the K question. The consumer is continually bombarded with uh, personal computers of 4K, 8K, 64K capacities, and I know that a lot of consumers don't understand what that K even stands for. Another question they have, uh, how much do I need to do the functions that I want to perform, let's say in a, in a domestic environment for record keeping, home ex expenses, income tax records, as opposed to, say, a small businessman who would want to develop uh, uh, a relatively small payroll and inventory control system. So can you kind of clear up the K question, please? Yeah, I'll, I'll attempt to address it, and uh, you're absolutely correct. It happens to be one of the most uh, misunderstood notions and concepts uh, that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, let's say that uh, the majority of available personal computers today because of the reduced cost in what's called RAM, and uh, K can refer to several aspects of the computer. Let's talk about RAM. That's basically where the uh, program is stored and where the data is manipulated. Uh, they try to address a number in the order of 64K. Um, that basically will provide you with more than an adequate amount of RAM to run both small business applications as well as uh, the lesser uh, demand type programs, uh, personal checkbook accounting, personal recipe maintenance, so on and so forth. Although 32K is another popular uh, demarcation point and used to be more than adequate uh, since the cost has come down, 64K tends to be the standard amount of RAM being addressed and most of the software addresses that. Uh, taking it one step farther, uh, you'll find that the multi-processor, multi-user systems basically address 64K RAM too. We like to uh, apprise people of the fact that uh, even the most complicated business systems oftentimes uh, operate on a user basis at a 64K RAM basis. And uh, probably more than that is not too significant. Software development to date, as far as we're concerned, really doesn't address 128K and 256K. Uh, we're in the process of evolving from an 8-bit processor to a 16-bit processor, which basically has the capability of dealing with a substantial uh, larger amount of program uh, use and also data manipulation. To date, there are very few 16-bit programs that are really uh, effective. Um, going beyond that, 32-bit, we have lots and lots and lots of programs that address lots and lots of what's called core rather than RAM. So. Uh, we were amused sometimes when someone asks how much core these uh, small guys have, uh, when in fact it's, uh, it's really not core at all. It's a, it's a whole separate area of a, of a micro uh, sector of RAM, which is being very well used today with the instruments available. 
Louie. Well, Dr. Trusty, if I were going to buy a, a personal home computer and I decided, yes, I could probably use one, where would I start? You're already uh, using language, which I think is, is perhaps a beyond most people. Would mm -hmm. we start by learning a language or would you advise someone to go to a store? Where, where do you start if in uh, this whole process? There's a couple kinds of, of uh, popular consumers that we're familiar with. Uh, one of them is a person who feels that he has to absolutely have a basic programming language or else he won't understand computers. Um, we tend to be opposed to that for the majority of people, uh, primarily because that's a whole different uh, aspect of, of computer technology and it really doesn't apply to what's called the uh, end user or application software and usage thereof. Um, we suggest that if a person, an average person or even a small businessman who doesn't want to become a programmer, uh, begin with the becoming familiar with the literature, if you will. Uh, investigate through uh, a myriad of available periodicals in, in your library if you feel uh, uncomfortable going to a computer store. Uh, go to a computer store. Most good computer stores will provide you with or direct you to a source where you can get uh, a myriad of information and read it comfortably in the privacy of your home without being influenced by some salesman who's trying to sell you a product. Uh, names of those magazines, and we do have some uh, on board if you'd like to bring yeah, some I, over. I would like to have some of those. Uh, and also maybe you can uh, answer Lou's question by also pointing out some <coughs> books that might be available. Surely, yeah, we have a few of those. Uh, we can uh, basically address a lot of uh, user questions by uh, recommending some magazines such as Popular Computing, Byte Magazine, uh, and we could just lay some of these out and you could take a shot at them. Um, this is Byte Magazine. I think we should hold those up. And, uh, yeah, this is a, a commonly uh, found, or well, it's a, it's a common publication in the industry, and it's extremely uh, well written. It tends to be a little more sophisticated than the average uh, user should be associated with, but within the body of this text, without question, there are uh, various articles written and uh, various levels of interpretation. So you can certainly find information uh, in here that would be beneficial. More importantly, uh, we can go through here and just open up randomly. This is a, a good way to learn. Uh, this particular page here represents uh, what is uh, commonly found throughout all these publications. And it's, uh, it, it's product knowledge. It's what's available today. These are ads, basically. These are ads, basically. Uh, that's a beginning. Uh, then couple that with, say, some of the, the contemporary articles, and I'll try to pull one out here with a title that you can read. Um, make some sense to you. You've picked the most sophisticated one. I, I think perhaps you should pick a less sophisticated okay. magazine, too. Let's, uh, this, this would show you a title of, a, of a, a commonly found article, and you could follow that up with uh, some of the advertisement information that you see here and begin to draw some conclusions about what's at least contemporary for the day. Popular Computing is a very good lay-type magazine. Uh, it's filled with a substantial number of, of easy-reading articles and uh, contemporary information via these uh, articles and the advertisement media about additional product lines. So we have uh, no less than five or six of them here that we're representing. Uh, and these are the kinds of things that we recommend that you look at before you ever go to a computer shop, if you can. because. They present information that's contemporary, and uh, it uh, seems to be in an uh, unbiased fashion rather than... That's very, very basic, but then should I be keeping a list of, of what I feel would be the important uses that I would be making of, of the machine in order to really make sure that it's okay. appropriate? Let's get back to the two kinds of guys that buy computers. Uh, one is a person who knows he needs a computer, but he doesn't know what kind. A uh, small businessman who has suddenly realized that He's just not contemporary. He's not being cost-effective or competitive. He sees his uh, associates uh, beating him at every turn with a computer. He then should probably select, rather than be involved in a computer selection, first should select a piece of software before he ever, ever considers a computer. Find the software that does the job for you. By that, you really backwards. mean the program. Exactly. I'm sorry. Uh, and go backwards and find a, pro uh, a system that will run your software. The other kind of a person is just a general interest person who feels like he's being sucked into a void because he doesn't know how to run a computer. Surprisingly, large numbers of people now feel insignificant because they're being surrounded by computer operations, yet they feel 
Uh, they know nothing about it, and they don't know how to start. And the world is going past them, yes, exactly. leaving them behind. Exactly. And uh, so for those people, I would recommend the periodical application, uh, getting familiar with some of the terminology so that when they go into a computer store for the second and tertiary and uh, application to find their information, that they won't feel insignificant. They'll at least feel comfortable with the word byte and kbyte and ram and so on. Thank you. Dr. Carter. Dr. Trustee, for the first-time purchaser, would you recommend that, that he or she buy uh, a, a low-priced personal computer or perhaps a more expensive one that, that they feel would meet future needs? Our philosophy is that uh, a first-time computer purchaser who is simply trying to expose himself to a computer should buy the least expensive object he can find. Even though it isn't uh, a fully operable computer, for example, it doesn't offer enhancements that, say, one does over the other, I wouldn't be concerned about too many enhancements. Uh, the notion would be that through the experience of putting your finger on a keyboard, uh, getting the integral relationship between the keyboard and, and the television response or the CRT uh, output, the uh, loading of, say, a simple uh, cassette program would give you a feel for how data gets in and out of a computer maybe playing around a little bit with uh, programming language such as BASIC or uh, some of the other popular languages uh, would be more than adequate to give you that exposure that you feel you need to have to be close to computer operations. And why pay a lot of money for it? For $99, $100, $200, uh, for example, uh, I didn't want to mention the product name, but I, I feel in this case it's important, uh, an Atari. 400 is a very, very strong computer, a 6502 processor. It's comparable to an Apple in many ways. It has some enhancements that are much stronger uh, and very inexpensive, not costly. Your learning curve is very inexpensive by using one of those. So How easy is it to trade up after one were to purchase, say, an Atari to, to a more sophisticated machine? Veritably impossible. <laughs> much like used cars, the, the value uh, uh, it goes out very rapidly, so as a result, I would recommend that you get the least expensive one that you feel comfortable with. And then after you've experienced uh, what a computer is about, and presuming that you might want to get a more sophisticated one, it will certainly help you in making that decision. Ray Myers. I'd like to continue on with this discussion just a little bit because I think this is very important. I think that's where the consumer is concerned in buying a computer. Uh, could you, in a nutshell, more or less list some of the uh, more desirable attributes of a personal computer. In other words, in order to have uh, a computer that you can add additional memory to, if you feel once you've made an initial investment that this is really what you, you want to do and what you can use in your business. So memory expansion, uh, attaching peripherals, uh, possibly someday you may want to put a letter quality printer on it. Uh, considering buying uh, disk drives that are not an integral part of the unit itself so that it's some, some, uh, you have an upgrade capability at some point in time. I've listed some of them. Can you elaborate on that, though, and give us an idea sure. of how you could uh, start out small and grow big? It, that's an important consideration for small business. I'm not sure that uh, the individual user needs to look at that, but uh, our recommendation is that uh, you buy something that has total expandability, upward vertical expandability. Uh, if you can afford it, we recommend that you buy a small S100 mainframe with an IEEE 696 bus. Now, those are some terminology. <laughs> Uh, I'm back again. They're, they're terms that need to be uh, said because there's no other way to say it. And then uh, you might follow that up by explaining that the special bus allows you to upgrade your computer to a uh, 16 or a 32-bit or a 64-bit processor as the new innovations come online. It's an S100 mainframe, meaning that it has basically a motherboard with uh, some, a series of slots which accept various kinds of boards. Uh, one board can be a complete computer system by itself, meaning that you can start off with a single station system and assuming that your business grows, you can add one for your secretary, you can add one for the vice president, simply by putting a board in the slot. It's very user friendly, if you will. So in that respect, uh, everything's expandable. Memory is expandable. Additional floppy disks or hard disks, and uh, presuming that assumes you know what those are, um, can be added at any time. So uh, it's a fully expandable system and probably the best buy on the market as far as we're concerned. Dr. Trusty, in a few minutes we're going to be dealing with the computer that you brought with you, and I think that will really be helpful to the viewers in that uh, they can see what we sure, can do online. Yeah. Before we do that, however, I would just like to have you to briefly 
comment with the audience uh, concerning both in the home and in a small business, uh, what are the uses of those computers? Give us some examples of things that people could do with a computer that they are not capable of doing without it or they can do it more efficiently. What I'm really basically asking is uh, what good is it to uh, the individual? Uh, what will it do for them both uh, in saving time or even be more profitable? Okay, today the, the computers tend to be uh, totally involved in doing routine tasks that, uh, and doing them very well on a repetitive basis and uh, in terms of small business and even home use. Uh, correspondence tends to be a routine task and uh, pretty repetitive. Uh, word processing is the uh, term used in the field of computers today that describes the act of designating a letter or a document to the screen, manipulating it, repairing it, uh, correcting the spelling, changing the paragraph configuration, and then sending it to a hard copy media such as a printer. Uh, that seems to be one of the greater uh, demand programs uh, as well as uh, database management systems. Uh, if you can liken that to a large file cabinet, maintaining records on people, records on this, records on that, rapid retrieval of information that are contained in those records, and uh, manipulation in terms of totals, in terms of statistical impacts on that kind of data held within is another one. Um, uh, another extremely popular uh, concept in software and computer use is called an electronic spreadsheet. That simply provides that uh, you can enter uh, quantitative and qualitative uh, notions on a grid, uh, if you will. We'll demonstrate that shortly. And uh, have uh, formulas uh, produce answers and transmit those answers to uh, column totals and row totals. Uh, a typical example would be cost uh, analysis, for example, uh, projecting cost uh, based on net expense, I mean, uh, profits based on net expenses and overhead. Uh, uh, let's suppose you're in a Pacific organization or for whatever reason you have a lot of mailing due and so forth, the word processing can assist you and uh, exactly. being able to do this on a very regular basis. Yes. Or, yeah. or just send they different letters to different either. people. <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> uh, it can also separate. Sometimes you mail to one group one type of letter and another group another type. Mm -hmm. We only have around 10 minutes in the program left and Although we have a lot of other questions I know that we would like to ask, I think that we could be a beneficial to the viewer, and that's why we're here, uh, if we would do some demonstrations. And I know yeah. you have an assistant with you today that uh, will be helping. Uh, but uh, could we go through some of these um, uh, programs and uh, you give some demonstrations to the audience? Uh, maybe we should start with the electronic spreadsheet. And yeah. you've mentioned that already, but uh, let us show on the screen. and. Uh, what it will do. Okay, we'll show you an example of uh, electronic spreadsheet application for the home use and then one for business. Uh, these are preconceived programs that we've already written. It'll take a few minutes to load them up and you'll see some of the typical and commonly used uh, approaches to this kind of software. Okay, uh, while your assistant is uh, loading this particular one in, Give the viewers a little bit of an idea of what they're going to see on the screen. Okay, uh, you're going to see some load time there, for example. And then uh, the screen will come up basically in a grid that will have across the top of the screen letters from A to Z and then double up again, and then numbers running from the top to the bottom of the screen on the left-hand side. Uh, those will represent your column entries and your row entries. Uh, if you can view that as a, a mailbox with... Uh, a small pigeonhole every, everywhere the uh, column and row comes together. That's effectively a, a data storage point. And you can either put a raw number in there or you can hide a uh, formula in there that will not appear on the screen and it will produce calculations for you. Mm -hmm. If we can get a shot of the screen now, uh, they'll get some idea, I think, of what is happening uh, with that electronic spread. Uh, and then maybe you can further explain what we're talking about. If the camera can get uh, a picture of the, the computer itself at this time. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Trusty, maybe you can tell us what is happening. Okay. Uh, basically, we see a, a column or entry there. I can't read the titles from here, but uh, basically, uh, what, what program is that, Bob? Yeah, why don't we have Bob explain that because he can... Well, do we don't have a mic uh, oh, at this I'm point, safe. but uh, <laughs> maybe Lou Reed would share her mic with him. And, uh, okay. Basically, a spreadsheet is columns and rows of numbers. 
like George explained. And uh, you have the columns labeled in as in the alphabet A through Z, and actually this spreadsheet goes A through Z twice, so there's twice the alphabet number of columns, and then it goes 255 rows down the, down the page. And with a spreadsheet, you can enter any name or any number that you want, and sum any sum or any kind of math functions, any columns or rows, in any particular way that you want to do it. And basically, like George was saying, you could do what-if scenarios where um, you have a bunch of different inventory items and your cost and and uh, the retail cost and and the difference between the two and, a, and a, even a third column and uh, you can have it report uh, if you raise the price of one item it will report exactly what the change is going to show in dollars that would be a really good use for a supermarket for example yeah for example you sure do uh, you know if you raise w one item one price and then it'll show what the end result is affecting the whole store basically mm -hmm. and uh, just by using a, a spreadsheet like this you can create many many false situations like that that uh, would uh in other words you can really get data that you wouldn't otherwise have uh, if you're dealing with an awful lot of items and a lot of detail right it's um, well somebody would have to do that longhand with a calculator and a piece of paper and, and if they do 10 of them you know it would take forever where the spreadsheet, you could do one and look at it, do another one and look at it, just right. repetitively like that. That's what Dr. Chester was saying about repetitive things that you keep doing over and over. Right. And basically, that's one of the things that the computer does. It does it efficiently each time. Or you get, you get to see the data more often as you make changes. Right. right. I see it any time. We, we, we are short on time, yeah. and, I, and I do want the viewers to see other things. I think, Dr. Chester, maybe we should move on to the word processing. Well, let's thing. do that. And uh, get that program in, and then maybe you will also explain to the viewers what's going to happen on this program. Okay, you're going to see a, a, a basically a, a menu come up from which all the processing is conducted. Uh, there are several avenues of exit from the main menu. Well, one of them will be called edit. Uh, pushing E on the keyboard, hitting return, takes you into the edit mode, and you'll be presented with a blank screen. At that juncture, you simply type in the information you, as you would like it to appear on the document, and uh, it will uh, represent itself through the tube. Uh, you'll have a chance to approve it. Uh, if you made a spelling error or a punctuation error or left out a word, uh, with the editing features that are included with most computers, you can go back into the document without leaving the screen and make those edit uh, changes, save the document, and then print it out in final form, much like a typewriter. The advantage, of course, in a, uh, lec uh, or a uh, word processor is that it will allow you to make the corrections while you're viewing the document, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, valuable in terms of time consumption. And then secondly, that uh, if you're going to make 15 or 20 or 100 or 2,000 copies of this document, it will do it for you efficiently without the continued uh, repetitive input. And, and so you get those documents and you distribute them wherever you're going to. You still have in the memory uh, the document uh, stored for future exactly. use, mm -hmm. or future uh, changes you might make. Word processing also involves uh, list of for mailing addresses and so forth mm -hmm. and you can categorize that by Would income age or whatever secondary function and you can uh, if you have the appropriate program sort by say for example uh, first three letters of a name or age of 49 and above or address and location or so on and so forth it's very handy for business and mailing again i'm rushing because i want to give them a third example we also have a program on data base management if we can get that in the computer sure. and again dr trusty would you explain what this will do okay, this is a program that basically does the things we just mentioned it will generate specific lists of data based on a large file of data if we want to send a specific response to say for example all of the physicians over 35 in spokane county if we've entered in all the physicians in Spokane County by some characteristic identifier, we can then conduct a sort. It will generate a list containing all those characteristics and the names of the physicians and then allow you to output that, for example, the same uh, form letter interjecting personalized aspects such as the name, the address, and in the body of the text, hi Joe, how are you? It will take his name and insert it as well as, uh, well, we realize you're using uh, clerical sterile objects today or something like that, uh, very, very personalized, giving the effect of each one of them having been handwritten or hand-typed, and uh, do it very efficiently, hundreds of thousands. 
you know, and the type of computer you have and its capacity will have a lot to do with how many possible combinations you could have. That, uh, the software tends to be the largest single uh, limiting device. Mm -hmm. uh, data storage would be second, and then the program capacity would be third. With 64K, uh, that generally addresses the most sophisticated mm -hmm. word processors. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're out of time, and uh, maybe our viewers will get a chance to see the computers we go off the air. But ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the program as much as we have uh, in bringing it to you and it's been in our case the most informative and I hope you'll be with us again next week when we'll talk about uh, the computer corporations in the Inland Empire and what they're doing. Please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time. Welcome to the campus of North Idaho College and today's broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of North Idaho College television students. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Today we wish to conclude our four-week series with you on the computer age and you. Our fourth program is entitled Computers and the Inland Empire Economy. In order to discuss this important topic, I am happy to welcome to our program, first of all, Gary Morgan, who is the Executive Vice President of Data Line Systems Corporation in Spokane, and Mr. Jack Hebner, who is the Marketing Manager of the American Sign and Indicator Corporation of Spokane, and our third guest is Dr. George W. Trustee, Jr., who is President of Articulate Systems Incorporated. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. I am also happy to welcome to our program the panel uh, to quiz our uh, guest today. First of all is Mary Lou Reed, a regular panelist, and I'm happy to welcome to the program Ray Myers, who is uh, manager of the Computer Center at North Idaho College. I will invite Lou Reed to commence the questioning. Gentlemen, <coughs> let's begin with the discussion of the impact of, uh, that the electronic industry is making on the Indian Empire's economy. Um, for instance, how many uh, operations do we have? How many plants? How many jobs? And do you have any idea of the number of dollars that this is adding to the Inland Empire's economy? Gary, can we start with you? Well, I think the impact is, is just beginning in what I would call a mushroom kind of growth. I've been a part of this impact in the Spokane community for almost 10 years now, and I've, I've been saying that literally for almost 10 years, but it is now really beginning to mushroom. And I believe that we probably have seen in that 10 years uh, somewhere in the order of six to 10 new companies start up. Jack, what are your comments to add? I think it's important to look at essentially what each firm does in terms of the overall product base, in terms of what it means to the community. Last year was not a very strong economic year, obviously, for many businesses. Yet our total volume in the fiscal year just ended will be somewhere around $47 million. We currently employ about 525, 540 employees. Is that the, your company or is that the uh, total economy? This is our company alone. Mm -hmm. And out of the 540 employees that we currently employ, we will probably spend about $12 million in total payroll, about $6 million of that right here in the Inland Empire. George, what can you add to that? Oh, boy, I don't know. Uh, in terms of uh, the impact on uh, our establishment, and it would be directly related to retail sales, uh, we've seen increased consumer demand, which has uh, realized itself in terms of our expansion, uh, more stores, more employees, more sales. I would expect at the end of this year we will probably have gross sales for a small 
firm in excess of $5 million. Uh, that will translate backwards to uh, maybe 25 or 30 new jobs in terms of sales and technical support. And that's a, that's really an impressive amount of money that's being added to the economy and certainly the, the number of jobs. Do any of you have any of the numbers, the overall numbers, that would uh, take care of, of Spokane? Are we talking are we talking in the neighborhood of $100 million? Would you estimate that is being added? Maybe I shouldn't ask you to guess. Maybe I should. Uh, it's a difficult one to, I have not prepared myself with that, but I, I was just doing a, a head count on my, on my hands here while Without, we you didn't talking. have your calculator. That's right. Mm -hmm. I didn't have my computer. All right. Yeah, that's, that's a big problem for myself. But I, I think easily we're talking about 3,000 employees associated with just the high-tech companies that are going to be covered by this show. And I can just interject one thing. Please. Keytronics alone employs 1,700 people. That's I found out during the research for this program. That's correct. So that's just one company. And the important summary, I suppose, would be what we started out with with Gary, is that you're saying it's mushrooming, so it is a, a growing industry. We're on the we're on the very beginning of the mushroom. So there's a big future for Spokane. Yes. Let our me projections, yes. excuse me, our projections though for the next fiscal year <laughs> show that that mushrooming effect may indeed hold true. I mean, we're not talking in terms of laying individuals off for 1983-84. We're in turn talking about increased sales and putting more money not only back into the Inland Empire, but more money in terms of all of the places where we have our people in, in our industry. And few industries are really able to have that kind of sense of optimism about the future in this, at this present time. It's very, That's very right. encouraging. Let me pass it on to Ray. Uh, I have one particular question. You, you're mentioning uh, your growth and expansion within the next uh, year and the year after and so forth. Do you anticipate uh, being able to recruit from the local area, local community? In other words, do we have adequate resources, uh, sufficiently trained personnel in the local area to uh, fill the various positions you see uh, appearing in the future for your companies? Anyone? I'll speak for our company, and, and that is Dataline Systems. We will be looking for probably um, between 50 and 100 people in the next 12 to 18 months. And uh, of those, I would, I would guess that 80 to 85 percent of them will be recruited locally. Now, in terms of, of high technology talent, uh, the community as a whole will have to import a great deal of that uh, from other areas of the country. But that's one of the things that Spokane has going for it, because I've been involved in that recruiting effort for many years, and it is not difficult to get high technology people to come and locate in, in Spokane. In, fa in fact, it's, it's amazing how many walk-in people we have coming to the community that have made the choice for uh, choice of living first and job second. I would probably just echo those kinds of comments. I think that any time you're dealing with attracting high, techno high technological people, uh, you have to look at four a aspects. And one is whether or not the people who are going to work for them are well trained, whether or not there is the availability of sites for expansion for, for new development, whether or not there is some sort of distribution system, and then over, overall the quality of life. Spokane has been blessed, I think, right now to have all four of those things. And I know that ASNI looks very carefully at hiring from within our own community. And I think that any expansion in this particular industry would be very well served by Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, the Inland Empire. Well, do you feel that the community colleges, as I see one of our major roles, is to help to prepare our local citizens for employment in the high-tech fields? Uh, the people that have been applying for employment with your firms, are they presenting the necessary skills uh, to fill some of the vacancies that you have, or are we missing the boat in providing them with the training and skill that they need? I'd like to address the, sure. we're having a slight problem in terms of uh, employment profile uh, acquisition. And of course, in sales, uh, you'd think that probably sales skills in itself would be adequate to represent the product line. However, that's not true in the case of high technology. So as a result, we see um, a slight void in our near future in terms of uh, qualified personnel, simply because those jobs that are available are generally, um, uh, let's say that the companies that are hiring at r large rates now are actually 
siphoning off the people who would be pretty well qualified or, or better qualified to be sales personnel. It takes a person with technical background as well as the ability to sell, and we find that that's a shortcoming locally. We're having a hard time finding people who have both the skills uh, that can come in and uh, work for us. I think the junior colleges are doing an <coughs> outstanding job in the area of, of uh, providing us with with technicians and and technical people to to attack the high technology service area and this kind of thing. The one area that I see a big gap in in the Spokane area in terms of a real high technology growth and being able to support it and being able to to attract the companies like Hewlett Packard and those companies is being able to advance uh, offer advanced degree programs from a major university. I cannot hire um, a double E graduate that wants to get a master's degree uh, in the next two years on a part-time basis into Spokane. He will, right. he will not come. Uh, Tony neglected to mention that Jack Hebner is also wearing another hat as a city council member of Spokane City Council. Jack, I think it would be very helpful if you would tell us a little bit about one, what are the advantages that Spokane has to offer uh, this particular industry, but also what the city is doing in the way of policies to uh, attract new industry. Well, essentially, as I mentioned before, really there are the four things that we try to sell, uh, the well-trained workforce, a distribution system in, of sorts, the availability of sites, and, and also the fact that we have an excellent quality of life in Spokane and throughout the valley uh, all the way to Coeur d'Alene. I think that what we're doing now is we're trying to make people aware of what Spokane has to offer. We do have some problems in terms of uh, water and sewer and availability of sites and, and that sort of thing. But rather than dealing with all of the political ramifications of whatever decisions are being made now, we have a potential, a tremendous potential for selling this area to high tech people. The quality of life is second to none. Our workforce, the junior colleges, uh, the seven major universities we have in this area, very, very well respected. And now we have to make that commitment to go out and sell ourselves, if you will, to those people. And I think that you'll find a tremendous amount of growth in that area. Raymond. Now, a number of people, including myself, I have to admit with the influx of new industry into our area all the time, well, I've heard of American Sign and Indicator, and I've heard of Articulate Systems and so forth. Uh, could you gentlemen please elaborate a little bit exactly what products your, your firms produce and just how are they serving our community? Uh, Gary? Dataline Systems, of course, is a very young startup company. Our product is a teller terminal system for commercial banks. And our marketplace is all commercial banks nationwide and at some point in the future internationally. Uh, the product is very unique approach to that teller terminal uh, need. I'm sure that, that most people in the area have heard the story of the Williams brothers and how they started in 1952 in a small sign shop and then suddenly developed the time and temperature and that's really how we got our start. During the past 31 years we've, we've been very fortunate to deal with financial institutions and put up time and temperature signs and also message centers which would advertise what services you can get from a bank. But today in the 80s we're now dealing quite heavily in sports systems, sports scoring systems. Uh, those employed at all of the major league uh, stadiums, if you will. The 1984 Olympics will be scored entirely by American Sign and Indicator equipment. Also major transportation systems and airports, employee communications. So we've sort of met the challenges of the 80s by taking the basic product and improving and expanding on that, and we're being very well received in the marketplace, and that's what we do. Thank you. Dr. Uh, articulate Systems basically addresses the, uh, the small computer user's needs, basically, uh, the young professional and the small businessman. Now, those are the vertical markets that we've chosen to address. However, with the product line we do carry, we tend to get almost anyone who's looking for a uh, small business machine. Uh, our major clients are uh, uh, primarily the young professional. An example would be a series of college professors uh, utilizing the product line that we carry, which is primarily portable computers to communicate with mainframes and the environment of their choosing, such as their home and their laboratories, rather than having to go over and wait in line at the mainframe line for long turnarounds. Um, small businessmen who 
formerly couldn't afford to even uh, conceptualize about a computer now can actually have an operable system and uh, uh, contractors, uh, small retail establishments uh, are now buying our product line. Um, home professionals such as uh, writers and authors, uh, word processing activities uh, is a vertical market that we have good success in with our product line. Lou mm -hmm. Reed. Well, uh, this is a Macy's and Gimbel's kind of a situation. Uh, what do some of the other firms that aren't represented on our panel produce in Spokane? I think probably the best known one would be Keytronics and keyboards. Uh, Keytronics, again, has been the kind of firm that grew up in Spokane. It's now a, a multi-million dollar organization expansion, I believe, to the Far East. Uh, that was recently announced also to the north of us in Newport. Uh, Keytronics, I think, would be the best known one in terms of local development and local growth. Any other comments on other businesses? And there are offshoots of, of companies like Keytronics already uh, within the Inland Empire. AID, Advanced Input Devices, is, is such an example. And Dataline, of course, is, is kind of an offshoot of international systems, although we come from totally different roots. What's missing? What's missing in this mushrooming future that you see, Gary? What other kinds of services will be and products will probably move into Spokane? It's, it's impossible to predict. I, I personally believe that high technology growth or any service and, service and manufacturing related uh, businesses based on high technology products is the kind of growth that is, is the lifeblood for the Inland Empire. It's clean industry. It provides the kind of job that is going to be growing and rather than disappearing in the in the in the late eighties. But to try and that's going to be the challenge. That is the challenge for new companies today is to come up with a solution to somebody's problem based on a high technology approach. Ray Myers. Uh, I really don't have any more particular okay, questions. I have one that I would like to pursue at this point that has to do with these other organizations that you service in addition to uh, what you've already said. Uh, could you give us some insight to uh, universities and colleges or businesses and industry or other private institutions that take advantage of uh, your products? And I know some of the products are shipped to other parts of the United States and even other countries in the world. But this show in particular is trying to emphasize the Inland Empire. Uh, you've mentioned banks and what you're doing there. Um, maybe we can start with you um, on this question, Jack. Uh, wh who are you serving in the Inland Empire? Okay, in the Inland Empire, really, the, it's a um, real sort of generic look at who we serve nationwide and even internationally. Our major markets are divided in terms of commercial, financial, transportation and sports. And as you look at each of those major market divisions, you can find customers, obviously financial savings and loans, banks, credit unions, etc. Uh, commercial, hotels, motels, feed stores, automobile dealers, grocery stores, the list goes on and on. Transportation, I airports, and then sports, obviously the stadiums. And Dr. Trusty, you really have a variety of customers, don't you, with your business? Some interesting customers we're working with now, and uh, you wouldn't really perceive them as, as really using our services. However, it's, it's interesting to note that, say, for example, Gener in General Instruments, uh, who also is in the business of producing keyboards vocally, uh, requires our service uh, to generate small networking uh, systems within their manufacturing organization. I would have thought that they would have been the first years ago to have a complete so, system. So you do a lot of writing in colleges, universities, many, many Westinghouse other. Hanford uses our systems for uh, monitoring and reporting data acquisition all over the United States. Uh, we must move on. I wish we had more time. I want to move to the second part of our program, which is highlighting the four corporations that we have here, uh, the three that are represented on the panel, and one other one that will be uh, a little bit later in the program. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Ray Myers from North Federal College to uh, find out um, what Dataline Systems is doing. <coughs> uh, Mr. Morgan, I'd like to ask you specifically, what industries or services do you uh, support in the Spokane region? I think as I previously commented on, our, our product is specifically targeted at the commercial bank. Mm -hmm. uh, we are finding uh, additionally that the changes in the banking laws are going to, to make the savings and loan institutions a 
a very good target for our product uh, in the next year to two years probably because most savings and loans are going to change their method of operation very radically toward that of a commercial bank. And since our product provides the ability to, to have that teller uh, save many, many operations and steps of, of check processing in the back room at the same time she's servicing the customer in a better way than she is today, as savings and loans take on the activities of checking, our product provides them a, a, an ability to get into that without having uh, massive investments in high-speed check processing equipment in the back room. Well, then, are, are we to understand that these uh, teller devices are, cr uh, directed, are connected directly to a mainframe, or are they collective on microprocessors and then batched uh, subsequently? Each, each teller window has a, a, a collection of equipment that is microprocessor driven at that window. There, in, in fact, are five microprocessors in the teller terminal itself. Uh, those are connected together on what's called a local network back to what, what a branch controller that is a microprocessor with floppy disk based on it to collect that data. And that concentrator, if you will, then is communicating to that host mainframe that may be located hundreds of miles or t tens of miles away from that particular branch facility. I must uh, also interject here at this point that, uh, Gary, another corporation that uh, is in our area is the ISC Corporation, and they're involved in the same thing as you are, and we were fortunate to have some footage from their company, which we would show at this time. And I would also indicate that the ISC Corporation of Spokane is a major producer of computers for the banking industry, not only of the Inland Empire, but in the numerous other states in the country, as some of the other corporations are. ISC builds the disk drives, the motherboard, CRT, processors, power system to the terminal, word processing, automated teller system. The computer is assembled in the factory, as shown here. Uh, all parts are thoroughly tested, and the entire system is tested, uh, for example, for a 48-hour period in what is known as the burn room. Each teller's terminal can tie into the branch bank computer or into the main office computer as so desired. The IC Corporation, like many other high technology companies, is rapidly expanding to serve the needs of their customers, as can be observed by the rapid expansion of the facilities housing uh, that industry. Uh, this is simply another example of what is going on with uh, the corporations and the economy in our area. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to invite uh, Ray Myers once again from the Computer Center at North Idaho College uh, to, in to find out what is also happening in that way at the American Sign Company. Uh, Jack, I'd like to ask you uh, specifically, um, you had mentioned the American Sign and, and Indicator's um, involvement with the airline industry and as far as transportation signs and what have you. I'm quite interested in that, uh, that whole aspect of airline reservation systems. Is your sign in some way connected to the, the main central computer that networks all the airlines together? Or, or just exactly how does this relate to airline reservations, let's say? Airline reservations are very difficult because we really don't do that. What we provide is a flight information display system, which we abbreviate as FIDS, F-I-D-S. And what you can do with one central computer is you can tie all of the flight information displays into that computer to access all of the departing flights, all of the arriving, depart all of the arriving flights, and any of the information that people who are in airports really need to, to know. Uh, our displays are programmable in any language. They are programmable, if you will, in terms of upgrading, deleting items, uh, a whole host of elements like that. So we're finding almost uh, international acceptance in all of the airports, and, and that's essentially what we do in that area. Uh, the majority of the um, um, manufacturing of the components and what have you uh, for your signs, uh, is that done in the Spokane area? Yes, all of our manufacturing is done here. And this year alone, we will spend approximately $1 million in this area just for the components alone for many of our electronic advertising displays and our flight information systems. Thank you. I think also, Jack, at this point, it would be very helpful for us to view uh, a couple of interviews that Lou Reed had on the location uh, with uh, some people in your company uh, in two different areas. And I think those will be both informative to our viewers. I'm here with Dr. Joe Thomas of the Keytronics Corporation. Dr. Thomas, Keytronics is one of the major electronic firms in the Spokane area. 
What kinds of computers does your company produce? Will you tell us a bit about yeah. them, please? Uh, Keytronics produces a uh, keyboards that are used as peripheral devices on computers. Embedded in each of the uh, keyboards is a microcomputer chip which handles the uh, uh, communications operations within the keyboard. Uh, we currently uh, use in the neighborhood of about one million of these microcomputer chips per year. Uh, we make uh, manufacture about that uh, a million keyboards. These keyboards are manufactured at three locations in Cheney, Newport, and Spokane. Well, who are your principal customers? Who buys your keyboards? Okay, we, uh, we uh, manufacture about 40% of the custom keyboards that are manufactured in the U.S. at Keytronics. Uh, most of the large uh, manufacturers of uh, computers have uh, uh, various uh, keyboard, uh, uh, Keytronics keyboards uh, in them. We understand that you're on an expansion uh, program and that one new plant will be in Taiwan. When will that happen? Yeah, we see we see a large expansion both uh, in some of the overseas locations and also in the in the Spokane area. Uh, as the number of computers uh, increases in terms of the production, each uh, each of these computers will have a keyboard in it. We see a large expansion in the U.S. here in the next year, probably in the Spokane area, or somewhere in the neighborhood of about five to six hundred people. In addition, we will be opening plants in uh, uh, Korea, Taiwan possibly Singapore to take care of the market in those areas. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I'm sorry to interrupt. We're out of time, and I want to express our appreciation to all the corporations and their employees and management that have been involved in this four-week series. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have enjoyed bringing it to you, and this is certainly an important topic uh, that we were trying to bring forth to you uh, that is going to be very much part of our future. The computer age in you has been the series. Uh, please be with us again next week at this very same time, and have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by a North Idaho College student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.